Well, yeah, I, I'll just touch on that. You know, the ICRP, the International Council on Radiation Protection, and the, um, the, the International Atomic Energy Agency um, are, are not going to correct it um, because they have that dual role of promoting and regulating. And, and right now, it's much more important to promote nuclear power than it is to regulate. Oh, nuclear Arnie, power. I, I just, this just takes my breath away. I mean, how many cancers are we going to see from this accident? I, I predict probably millions. People might say... I'm at a, I, I'm at a, a million myself. I, I firmly believe that uh, in the first 20 years of the, of the incident, we'll see at least a million uh, new, new additional cancers above and beyond what you'd expect for a population of that size. Well, certainly 25 years post uh, Chernobyl, the estimate is more than a million. And Chernobyl, they say, is was an accident that was less severe than Fukushima. What, how would you compare Fukushima now to Chernobyl, Arnie Gunderson? Well, they, they say that, uh, um, again, this is all calculation, Helen, because it's all assumptions. Nobody had radiation detectors to figure it all out. But they say that the total releases from Chernobyl were 75 tetra becquerel, so million billion. Well, we already know 30 got in, has already leaked into the Pacific. And so it's even using TEPCO's numbers were essentially identical to, um, to Chernobyl. But actually, the, the problem is that, that the population density around Fukushima and you know, through Japan, mm. it was much greater than the population density in the Ukraine where, where, where Chernobyl occurred. Mm. And, and frankly, the Russians got people out a lot faster than the Japanese did. So you've got higher population and a, a much poorer response for emergency planning um, from an exposure that was at least as much. Frankly, I think it was more. But even using Tokyo Electric's number, it's at least as bad as, uh, as Chernobyl. Uh, so, yes, I, I think if you use the Chernobyl numbers and scale up by population density, you'll definitely have more than a million cancers. Yes, and, 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 and we must always remember the accident has not yet finished. That's right. That's right. You know, you mentioned the, the let's go back to the cesium issue for, for a split second. Uh, you know, your body is not in equilibrium with cesium. Your body is in equilibrium with potassium-40, which you take in, you, you excrete out, and you're in equilibrium with it. Cesium is, you're, is not a naturally occurring thing. It was not meant to be in your body, and it replaces potassium. It's a potassium analog, like you said. So that the... Um, uh, and cesium is a much more powerful um, amount of energy it releases on every on every decay than potassium as well. So the, the, the Japanese um, uh, comparison in trying to minimize the fact that there's cesium in the milk um, to a very radiosensitive population, the very youngest Japanese, is uh, is appalling, if you ask me. How do you think the cesium got in the milk? They're saying that, you know, they had it drying and it fell on the drying milk. But I suspect as the cesium got into the beef, radioactive beef, that the, after the cows ate uh, rice hay or rice straw that was contaminated, that the milk itself was radioactive. Would you agree with that, Arnie? I agree. Yeah. Uh, the, the cows are radioactive yeah. and the milk is... They're not sampling all the cows. I mean, initially, all they did was rub the hide of the cow. Oh, really? The hide came up, yes, the initial tests on cesium um, for, for the cattle were to rub the hide. They didn't even look at the Good meat. Good now, now they're looking at the meat, and, and oh, my God, now they have to look at the, uh, at the milk. So, um, yeah, and they're only sampling a, a few cattle in a herd. They're not sampling the entire herd. But I think you're right. It came from the food. You know, the rice straw is contaminated. We're now at a point where almost all the rice in Fukushima Prefecture has been judged to be um, not usable uh, so that, um, you know, it's, it's on the ground and, and has contaminated as much as, you know, 10 or 15 percent of the entire nation of Japan. Um, I, I read that 50% um, of the rice grown in Japan grow, is grown in Fukushima. Prefecture, fifty percent. Yes, 
Yeah. Yeah. At, at least fifty percent in Fukushima Prefecture. Yeah, so uh, is uh, it, is no longer um, yeah. fit for sale. Now, and uh, Arnie Gunnison, um, the, I want you to talk about how much of Japan is contaminated. I've read two different estimates. One is that fifty percent of Japan is now contaminated with radioactive fallout. But another estimate sh said it was 8% of the land in Japan is contaminated. What, what, what do you say about that? Well, I think it depends where you set the criteria. You know, if, they, if you call contamination um, um, you know, 1,000 becquerels per square meter, um, you'll come up with one number. But, you know, the Japanese consistently are raising the allowable amount. They're, raising, they're lowering the bar. Um, to, to make more and more of the land habitable. Um, so it really depends on what you consider to be um, a, a reasonable amount of, of radioactive cesium to have on the, on the ground in, uh, you know, in your backyard. Um, but I, I have, uh, I, it's pretty clear that um, almost all of the entire prefecture of Fukushima uh, is so contaminated that the best solution would be to uh, to remove two centimeters, uh, five centimeters rather, of soil for the entire prefecture, and that includes the mountain ranges. There's a, there's an article in the New York Times from December 6 that discusses the fact that they may have to clear cut the mountain ranges to then get to the soil so they can decontaminate the mountain ranges. Because if they don't, 70 percent of Fukushima prefecture is mountain ranges. So if they don't clean the soil, uh, it will continue to run into the, into the rivers and it will continue to get airborne uh, with passing storms and gusts of wind and they'll never get to the root of the problem. The New York Times also said that there's going to be parts of um, Fukushima Prefecture that will, uh, if, if people ever return, it will not be in the lifetime of the people that are there now. So we're talking about, you know, 50 or 60 years until people can return to some of these areas. Well, the fact that cesium has a half-life of, of, of uh, 30, years 30 years and lasts for 600 years, it's not just, you know, in their lifetime, it's, it's many, many generations. And that's true for areas around Chernobyl, too. Um, I had another... You know, they're counting for it to, to also wash away. They're not going to not just going to decay away, it's going to wash away. Um, and, uh, of course, that then throws more of it into the ocean in the long term. But, but Arnie, the, the decontamination is a myth. I mean, you can't decontaminate land. Where are you going to put the, all the soil, that you know, the millions and millions of tons of soil you've dug up to dig a deep hole and put it, and then it's going to leak into the underground water system, then rise up into the streams and recontaminate food chains uh, for the rest of time. You can't decontaminate land. You can't. And what they're doing is plowing um, school playgrounds and, uh, uh, you know, and, and amassing large quantities of soil. But it's kind of like Port Hope in Canada, which is extremely contaminated. They say they'll just, you know, remove the contaminated soil and bury it somewhere else. You can't get rid of the radiation. You can't get rid of it. I, I think well, it's they're talking about if they just did the habitable, the portions that are inhabited in Fukushima Prefecture, and, and I agree that that doesn't solve the problem, but if they took off five centimeters, two inches of soil, yeah. for the habitable portions of Fukushima Prefecture, they would fill up 50 stadiums the size of the New Orleans Super, uh, Superdome. Um, it's, a, it's a huge stadium in, in, in New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, and, of course, that doesn't include the mountain ranges. Mm. Some Japanese scientists just came out. Uh, I can't believe they said this, but they actually said, well, the best solution would be to take the dirt that we, that we um, scrape off our land and uh, take it out into the ocean, yeah. where the ocean is at least 2,000 meters deep. So, uh, you know, 6,000-foot ocean, a little more than a mile and dump it in the ocean. That's their, their solution. Yeah. There's a lot of international treaties that the Japanese are signatories to that prohibit that, but yet you know, academians in, in Tokyo believe that a solution would be to dump it into the ocean. I can't believe, Arnie Gunderson, that there is not a push 
a concerted push by international scientists who understand what's going on to blow the whistle on what the Japanese government and TEPCO are doing, you know, rather than, you know, evacuating hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, they are, if you can't lower the water, you raise the bridge, they're saying, well, look, it's okay now to live in areas which are polluted to thus and thus radiation, whereas before it was illegal. I can't understand why there isn't an outcry inter from from international bodies who understand what's going on. Can you explain that? Um, I can't either. You know, I'm working with some truly independent scientists, Tim Mousseau, who you had on earlier, and 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 others. Um, I'll give you an example, though. We have we, we've been working with with uh, Marco Kalthofen, and uh, he's at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and uh, um, we've been analyzing. People have been sending Marco. They they contact Fairwinds, the 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 website that that uh, Maggie and I uh, run, and we give them shipping instructions, and they ship car filters to to uh, Mr. Kaltofen in, in Massachusetts, and he analyzes them in, a, in, in a several sophisticated uh, devices. We've gotten some car filters from Fukushima Prefecture that are so radioactive that he, Mr. Kaltofen, has to dispose of them as radioactive waste. We are He's shipping these car filters to a radioactive waste dump in, in, I think, Texas, you know, where they bury it under 30 feet of soil. Mm. So these air filters from Fukushima cars are so radioactive that in the United States we consider them radioactive waste, and yet the Japanese are doing nothing to warn the auto mechanics who are removing those air filters. Um, there's a lot of money on the line here, Helen, and, and I'm afraid that within Japan, TEPCO and the Japanese government are um, are closely affiliated and don't want um, TEPCO to go bankrupt. I, I believe I believe this will be about a two hundred and fifty billion dollar cleanup, and uh, you know no one has ever spent that kind of money on a cleanup before. Well, and, and of course, within the United States, we've got a, a regulator in an industry that uh, that also want to uh, perpetuate and increase the number of nuclear reactors worldwide. So there's a lot of financial pressures to uh, to minimize the effects of Fukushima. Well, you know, it's interesting talking about car filters. <laughs> what about the human filter? And that's the lung. So you could extrapolate from those car filters to human lungs in Fukushima province. And that those people must have been inhaling huge amounts of radiation because with each breath you inhale it as the car filters suck it in and it's not excreted, or over time it might be a little bit by the cilia washing it out in the bronchi, but, but, but the lungs will be accumulating a large quantity of radiation like the car filters. Yes, and actually um, what we've done, Helen, on the um, Fairwind site um, back, at, back on uh, October 31st, uh, I did a summation of, of, of Marco Kalkofen's speech. But just this week, here in early December, uh, there was a professional photographer who who did a video of Mr. Kaltofen's speech, and we put that on our website. And he talks about that in in the presentation to the American Public Health Association. Um, Marco Kaltofen discusses the fact that these car filters are absorbing just about the same amount of air per day as a human lung. Yeah. And here we have to dispose of these car filters as radioactive waste. Yeah. And, and what, what isotopes, elements, are being found in the car filters? He's just, he's, he is not analyzing uh, for, for strontium because it's difficult to find. Uh, and he's, um, it's a, he's, all, he's found americium, he's found uh, um, uranium and, and some others. But predominantly he's looking for uh, cesium-134 and 137. And those are occurring in in identical ratios, rough, roughly the same amount of cesium-134 to cesium-137. And that's a, a, a sure indicator that what he's measuring came from Fukushima, mm. 